Hey, everybody, this is Bob. I want to let you know about a resource we just released through the John Paul II Healing Center, which is an eight-hour Healing the Whole Person. It's a longer version with Sister Miriam James Highland and me, and it's got an extra 10 hours of question and answers over several conferences that are just really good information for you, a leader's guide and a, and a workbook. And right now, for an, a little while, we're offering it for a 25% discount for all of our listeners for Restore the Glory. So it's Restore 25 and go on our website and download it. Really think it's going to help bring you deeper into the healing process. And talks are beautiful. If you know Sister Miriam, she just goes right to the heart. So I hope you enjoy it and uh, God bless you. Welcome to Restore the Glory podcast. My name is Jake Kim. And I'm Bob Schutz. We're two Catholic therapists sharing what we've learned personally and professionally to help you on the journey of restoration. If you've been blessed by our podcast, please prayerfully consider partnering with us on Patreon. Your support will help cover the cost to produce the podcast, but will also give you access to exclusive content like monthly reflections and special live stream teachings. Go to patreon.com slash restore the glory and join the mission of experiencing the restoration of our God-given glory. Hey, Bob. Good to see you again. I hope you're doing well. I, I saw you, Bob, not long ago. How are you doing with all the cornhole losses? True, Jake. You had to bring up the I did. I had to bring it up. Just, uh, the, the part of me that's the competitor and the part of me that's wounded from your beating me so badly. <laughs> the mood just went boo. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's bring it back up. Sorry, that's a little tease for us. But Bob, we have a, another special guest with us today as we're continuing on in this series on parts work. Which, by the way, is something I think that's absolutely fantastic for people to understand, to integrate, to learn from. I think it's just a brilliant way to work with the internal dynamics of our heart. So we have a special guest with us. Why don't you introduce Bria to us? Yeah, this is a joy. I've been waiting for a while since I I was able to review Bria's book, which will be out in April, uh, called Befriending Our Inner Child. I had a chance to review it, and once I reviewed it, it was just so compelling to me. I had the desire to reach out to her and have a conversation, and then uh, hear about her life and about her work, and invite her to be a part of our podcast. So we've been waiting a while, finally here. And uh, so, Bria, welcome. Uh, Bria Hannon, you want to just share a little bit about your your family and your life and your work uh, for everybody? Yeah, sure. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. It's truly an honor. So I'll start with the kind of basic um, introduction, and then I'll get into my story a little bit. And um, I'll just warn everyone, it's going to go back to a downer again. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. awesome. Okay. But I am a mother, a wife, um, Catholic therapist, and um, I'm currently residing in Arizona. I'm originally from Northern California. That's where I grew up. I'd say my story really begins with my um, my parents, uh, their parents, and my mom's parents' divorce. And so after that happened, my mom was 16, and she ended up, I think, really trying to fulfill a lot of her unmet needs from her childhood. And so she got pregnant and had me. That experience um, of being kind of a young mom. And um, I think all of the stress that comes with that um, is something that I feel like I carry in my body as well. Unfortunately, my parents uh, separated shortly after and my dad left to college. And so um, they never reunited. They never reconciled. And that became kind of a a split in my identity because I knew I had um, a dad. I just couldn't see him. I couldn't access him. It didn't seem like he wanted to be a part of my life. And so... Um, There's a lot of just pain early in my story, and um, shortly after, there was a great grace where my my mom met my stepdad, and he took care of me and raised me, and um, I just love him for his heart and for his willingness to be a father at 17 um, years old. But there's a lot of complexity in that, too, because as my dad um, raised me, and they're still very young, um, I had to, you know, go to different babysitters. And my dad's dad, my stepdad, who I call my dad, um, unfortunately, his 
his father molested me. I disclosed that when I was around five years old. And um, after that, I think a lot changed for me. Naturally, I'm very bubbly and outgoing and um, very lively kid. But I think after that, I became very withdrawn and shy and just reserved and uncomfortable in my body. I think the most traumatic thing was that after that experience, um, having to see lawyers and counselors and talk to police officers, it was just so scary and um, alarming as a child, especially. That I think that's actually a lot of that um, the trauma lives in my body of just so much of attention during that time. It was kind of negative attention, and it completely destroyed uh, my father's family system. It created so much tension between. Um, him and his parents. And so I I blamed myself, right? And especially not understanding, you know, that's not my fault. And um, I did the right thing, right? You don't understand that as a kid. You just see the chaos and everything after that. And so I lived with a lot of shame uh, very early on. Uh, Thanks be to God, around eight years old, my parents um, started to explore religion. And my dad um, had grown up Catholic, but kind of cradle Catholic. Um, so my mom explored that faith first, and she was very moved by the Catholic Church and felt very at home there. And so we all became Catholic, and we kind of started our faith journey together as a family, which did change the trajectory of my life. And I'm just so thankful for that because it was the first time I think um, I started to experience what I would call like authentic love. Right? I felt very safe with Jesus. Um, And um, at the time, I also met a friend who was very Catholic, and um, her her and her mom lived a very sacramental life, so she would take me to youth group and things like that. And in middle school, I had this huge encounter with Christ through the Eucharist, and so it was um, kind of like a praise and worship kind of setting. And I just remember feeling like, oh my gosh, like, the Lord is so real and he encounters us and he draws near to us. And I could tell that my peers were having this huge experience of being loved and experiencing peace. And so I just remember praying like, Lord, I want that. Like, I want to know what that feels like in a real embodied way. Of course, I didn't have a language for like embodiment and all of that, but I knew that I was experiencing the Lord kind of more cognitively and I just couldn't fully um, always feel it. And I think you know, that was such a great grace and blessing, and I'm forever grateful for that experience. However, I think um, there was just so much complexity in my family system and unresolved trauma with my parents and their own traumas. At that time, too, I started to see my biological father um, every other weekend, and so we were kind of reunited. But I, get the, I had the sense that I'm just not enough. Um, And so when I would go there, it would create a lot of deeper wounding for me. Uh, I just didn't feel like he was very interested in me. And um, I think that would just create a lot of pain. So when I would leave church, when I would leave youth group, the pain was so great that I didn't know what to do with it. And so I noticed I started becoming a little bit kind of divided interiorly. And that continued all throughout high school. And It really magnified um, after I experienced some more deeper traumas. And so I was dating someone at the time, about 15 years old, and he kind of betrayed my trust. And there was something that like shifted in me. And it was the most bizarre thing. And I know now that it was um, kind of awakening or kind of pointing or at all of those wounds that were living in me that I didn't have language for. And so... When that happened, that's when I noticed a very a big split where I started to not care. There was this part of me developing that was very careless and reckless. And I really had this belief like my life really doesn't matter. And then shortly after that, at 16, um, in that kind of spirit, that vein of like, I don't care. It, you know, whatever happens to me happens to me, right? I started dating uh, this guy who was much older than me. All of the red (laughs) flags were very uh, very apparent, but there's this this part that said, I don't care. Uh, I'm not enough. I don't care what happens to me. I just want to kind of live reckless. And there was something thrilling about it. 
and he ended up raping me. Um, and, uh, unfortunately, um, I think that was the moment that, um, that split became really embodied, um, where I could feel the dissociation and, um, and he knew I was waiting to marriage and it was a big fight and conversation. And, um, there's a lot that went into that that was very traumatic, but I could f- remember feeling like almost my body lifting and kind of watching it all. And, um, and I remember just kind of like a robot, just kind of walking home. And it was, of course, raining that day, like a movie. And, you know, just going into the shower and just sitting on the floor. And you just, you're just a body at that point, you know. I think that just stayed with me, um, that split feeling. And then I, um, you know, the Lord has been so good in that I've always earnestly sought him. Even when I was going through that, I would never stop going to mass or you know, trying to seek him in adoration and through the sacraments. And so I really thank the Lord for that grace. Um, And it did carry me. And so I know I, at that time, I wanted so desperately to just get away and like start a new life and just be so, I have such an intimacy with the Lord. And I wanted to go to Franciscan and unfortunately parents wouldn't let me. Um, And so I ended up going to La Loya Marymount in LA, which is a little bit closer to home. Everyone was so good to me there. And so that was a blessing to be among religious and priests who took a special interest in me um, and just helped me to, I think, start to name some of these things for myself. Like, I didn't even think I was raped. I, I really blamed myself um, and thought, well, I put myself there. You know, I, I dated him. I, I knew he was bad, um, not a good guy. And so that it was the first time I started having language and people telling, no, 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 <laughs> um, which was really um, help, so helpful for me. And um, but at, during that time, though, that that dissociation, that disembodiment was really creating almost like a split person where I was very religious and doing all these things and felt that I could feel the gratitude and feel the love from these people. But I was living a very secular life outside of it. So when I would leave those spaces, I was doing everything, you know, under the sun that was not religious um, and not very, you know, Catholic or holy. And I just maintained that. Uh, I didn't know what to do with it or have words for it. I just was kind of living in this kind of autopilot. And um, when I went to um, grad school, we had to go to therapy as part of the program you know, it's so funny because I'm here studying, studying counseling psychology. I want to be a therapist. I want to help people. But I'm like, no, I don't need therapy, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I really I really thought that like it's for, you know, I have I have my religion. I have spiritual director. I don't need therapy, you know. Um, and so I remember going, having to go and I just hating it. And I would just cry all the way home because I, I just didn't know the gravity and the complexity. I didn't know like um, how much I hated myself. I hated my body, I hated my skin. I hated just so many things that I just wasn't even aware of. I, you know, everything was just so surface level. Um, I feel insecure. Um, I thought that a lot of my sadness was because I left from home and I missed just being back at home. Um, I didn't know like how much, I was angry at my mom or um, felt so betrayed by my stepfather or felt so heartbroken and and feeling that grief of not knowing what it feels like to have a biological dad who pursues me. Like none of that. So I was just like, therapy's the worst. Like, I don't want to know any of this because, (laughs) you know, I, I was kind of learning how to survive without having to feel the depths of that pain. Right. Mm. Um, And I was keeping busy and doing so much that it was kind of helping me just to move forward, right? So there was this breakthrough moment when um, my therapist, I was very frustrated, and I talk about this in the book, and I'm like, I don't even want to be here, so let me just go through the motions. And she's like, well, how are you feeling? And I'm like, powerless, I feel stuck, I, this, you know, I'm kind of like frustrated, I feel like nothing's working, nothing's changing. And she just asked me, um, is that how you felt as a child? And all of a sudden it was like, whoa, like no one had ever asked me that. And I was like starting to remember for the first time, like, oh yeah, like 
that's exactly how I felt as a child. Like I didn't even make that connection. And so it was the first time I could start to see like, maybe this isn't just me. Like maybe it's not that I'm not enough or that I live in this story of this reality where I am powerless, but maybe my child self feels that way. Mm. Maybe if I could somehow support her and care for her and love her and give her those things that she didn't receive, that maybe she could feel healed and whole and loved. And so it was the first time I could start to separate this part where it didn't feel so blended in me. And it led me on that journey of kind of exploring inner child work, having language for um, the inner child, right? Reading to different books. And then, um, you know, I'm in grad school, so I'm like learning about trauma and attachment um, and, you know, some neuroscience. So I'm just starting to like have language and it's starting to make sense and clicking for me. And a lot of my method and how I've come to um, practice inner child work has been just the integration of all of that learning. Mm. And, you know, I would say to you, Bob, too, I remember, you know, being in the car, listening to Abiding Together, and you were a guest speaker on there. And it was the first time I felt like, oh my gosh, like faith and psychology can be integrated. Like it doesn't have to be the separate thing where I go receive, you know, guidance over here. And then I have to go to this therapist over here to get the psychological, mm. like it could all be one. And and um, that was very freeing and um, hopeful for me. And so I also, I think after that learned, like, I can do that too. I can start to integrate what I know about my faith. You know, I could talk a little bit about my work, but um, I had a special affinity to um, St. Teresa of Sioux and, you know, the little way. And so it was just all like clicking and connecting and just bringing it together has been kind of my journey professionally. And also it's helping me personally. It was, I started to feel compassion for myself for the first time. And um, I felt like I had tools to care for myself when these different parts of me came up and continue to come up. Um, and so now my, after grad school, I, you know, got married and, my story right now is just have has been about just caring for that child and kind of unlearning a lot of things that I learned growing up and um, kind of and doing some of the harm too that I think I brought into my marriage because um, I wanted to be married and have children so bad and just like my mom kind of carrying that story of like I just want something so different and I like I want um, a family where I can feel loved and. Um, I can feel these things I didn't get to experience, but not understanding that there's a lot of unconscious drive in that and um, a lot of kind of using people in, um, to get those needs met. And so hmm. that's kind of where my journey is right now and where my story is kind of unfolding and learning um, more about myself and um, kind of repairing some of that harm and trying to uh, authentically love. And yeah, hmm. that's where I'm at. Yeah. One of, one of the things last week that Jerry talked about when Jake asked him the question, how do you know the difference between your part and your authentic mm -hmm. self, your, your, what he calls the inmost self? And he said, well, the parts all have agendas. Just as you were describing that, that's what immediately came to mind is just recognizing the difference between that authentic desire to love and be loved versus mm -hmm. these kind of hidden motivations that have agendas associated with them attached mm -hmm. to them. Mm. Yeah, that's so good. Priya, thank you. That's, yeah. wow. <laughs> that's a, there's a lot. I just appreciate your vulnerability. There's so many various areas that stuck out to me. W would you mind? I, I don't even know how to, this is probably a difficult question to transition it because you're, you're, you're also a clinic, you're a clinician. Mm -hmm. And so as you're sharing your own story, you, you also have learned a lot. It sounds like you've learned a lot from your own story, and then you've learned a lot clinically that then came into this book. So what I'm thinking of is for the listeners to almost get the whole picture, and mm -hmm. then maybe we can hop around in the whole story to just ask various things, and you can nuance various things for us. So you're describing more recently where you're trying to have authentic love come out. You're, you're learning to care for parts of yourself Mm -hmm. And you're also now in practice and you wrote a book. Can you, can you flesh out that part for us? So yeah. then we can see all that. Yeah, sure. Sure. Well, I just appreciate your patience. I know that story is very long. <laughs> no, it's good. There's a lot there. Honestly, yeah. there's a lot there. I think will bless a lot of people. And touching and, and uh, heartbreaking all at the same time. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, my story really informs um, the work that I um, am doing as a clinician. And I kind of talked about that integration, right? So essentially what I would do is start to have language and tweak that language based on my own experience and what I feel like someone who's experienced trauma would really relate to. So for example, well, let me tell you the model and then we can kind of go into a little bit more depth. So there's kind of four parts to this model. Uh, The first is psychoeducational. So I begin by just kind of informing the the, uh, client who their parts are and helping them to start to see it. So we talk about in the book, the Imago Dei, which is image of God on Latin. And that's not necessarily a part. It's just who you authentically are. It's your core being. Hmm. And I also use kind of the term beloved, a beloved child, right? That's just who you are. Um, And then I talk about how that kind of gets split or fractured, where you still always have that. That will never go away. But this other part kind of forms based on our unique wounding and trauma and attachment injuries and even sin. And I talk about that in the book too, like the fragmenting force. So there's things that fragment us Mm. or kind of take us away from living in that embodied state of being God's beloved. Mm. And um, that's that wounded child. And then on this kind of flip side of that, the protector or the angry child or adolescent self develops. So they kind of go hand in hand. Um, And that's because as soon as we start experiencing wounding, we almost have to develop a false self to survive that. And that's the protector, right? It's it's learning um, how to exist in dysfunctional systems. It's how to kind of exist um, after trauma, right? And it's learning what, from a really childish perspective, how to survive. Yeah. So, and that part's holding a lot of our defense mechanisms, our anger. A lot of people don't realize how much anger they actually hold um, and our pride, right? Our self-reliance. So those are the parts. And then we have this adult self, the spirit led adult self who the Lord gives us right away, even though it's adult self, right? Especially when we're baptized as infants, that is a way to kind of um, get connected with that spirit, right? Alive. And then of course, when we're sealed um, in confirmation, right? With, by the Holy Spirit, the more we live kind of that sacramental life, a Holy Spirit driven life, this part actually grows and matures and blossoms even more. And it, from just a brain kind of perspective, it's kind of the part that the Lord blesses us with that holds our executive functioning. So mm-hmm. it's a very rational part. It's kind of the part that goes, hmm, maybe, maybe I'm not too broken. Maybe this has to do with my wounds, right? Yeah, it's yeah. that, you know, that part. And so what I tell my clients is, In order to experience integration and wholeness, that adult self has to mature and become more saturated in the Holy Spirit so that it can essentially cooperate with God's parenting and how he parents us to come into that wounded part and that protector and to support them and give them their unmet needs, right? Because the reason why they're, you know, the 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 protectors kind of acting out, if you will, and that wounded part is so wounded is because they they are not given something that they're endowed with, right? That, that they were in, they're supposed to be given, right? They know that instinctually, that there's something missing that is theirs, right? And so they, they, you, they'll come up throughout our entire lives, basically grasping and clinging to get those needs met. But again, from a very childish perspective. So we bring that maturity in and the Holy Spirit to meet those needs and care for them in the ways that they've always needed to be cared for. And then I tell my clients, essentially, what you'll get as you do that work is a whole child. Everything starts to become more integrated and work together. And you start to see a more congruent person who is living from integrity and worth, kind of letting that belovedness shine. Mm. So that's the psychoeducational piece, yeah. (laughs) And so when you say the fragmenting four, is that... That's the Mago Day, the wounded child protector, spirit led adult self. Is that right? Um, so those are the just the parts. The okay. fragmenting four, how it fragments us would be uh, sin, trauma, uh, attachment injuries, and then I talk about in the book complex grief, which I didn't say. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. Cool. Bob. Yeah. I, I just as soon as I read it, it just resonated so much with me in terms of just life and what I've experienced in my own life, but what I experienced in working with people and 
the thing that I loved was so simple. You know, it was, there's a, a mark of the spirit in simplicity. And, mm. and I could really hear through your own struggles and your own journey to come into wholeness and to, you know, it's an ongoing journey for all of us, but your own struggle and journey and your own faith life and your own searching and then your work with people. I could just hear it all coming together in you, which allowed me to trust it immediately. It was just like, this is really true and authentic and real. And it resonated so much with, with what I knew. Yeah. Is it, does it go, sorry, Bria, I can imagine mm-hmm. the listener who's like, wait, wait, she didn't finish. Like their psycho ad, where does it go next? Like, Oh yeah. 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 So the, the next piece I would say is uh, it's relational. So kind of to your point, Bob, I found that when I was exploring IFS, it was hard for me to imagine being in relationship with so many different parts. Um, I know for me personally, like if I have too many friends, I'm not a good friend. Right? <laughs> it just becomes too much, especially as a mom and wife. And so I kind of saw, I, I started noticing I was getting a little overwhelmed by this idea of befriending um, so many different protectors and managers and firefighters and things like that. And so this work is really about trying to be like, to use your language, to be as simple as possible so that you can enter into a loving relationship. And then you start to uncover what each part needs, how they show up in your life, and then how to communicate with each part. And and really, we're just talking about the wounded child and the the angry child or adolescent self. The adult and the amago day kind of always are working together. So these are the parts that I would say you're entering into a deeper relationship with and trying to love and show compassion and meet the unmet needs. And then um, this work is also very structured. Oh, yeah. Do you have yeah, questions? Can I, yeah. Can I just interject for a second? So, you know, putting that in relation to the IFS, the internal family systems, mm-hmm. when they talk about exiles and they talk about all kind of different exiles and all kind of different woundedness, they would all be included in the wounded child. Yes. And the and the protectors, the firefighters and the managers would all be included in the angry adolescent, the, the protective parts, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Good. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Keep going. I just wanted to yeah. make that clear for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. And then I would say um, it's very structured. So why I think the structure is important is because for a lot of trauma survivors, it's chaos. It's so complex. There's so many layers and there's so much confusion too, as you kind of dive into all of that, especially too, if you grew up in a home that was outwardly appeared loving and religious, right? As so many of us um, did who are Catholic, it, it can get confusing when you're like, well, my experience though is telling me something a little bit different than what we are portraying to others or how we're showing up in mass or things like that. So I wanted to make sure that there is predictability, that there's a sense of structure so they know what to expect. And it f- starts to feel like, oh, wow, we're, we're making some movement. We're working towards something. And so we began by um, just exploring those parts and having language. And I have people start to plug in their own unique experiences within each part. So they can start to really see that image of themselves in these different parts. And then um, we start doing a lot more, which is the kind of the last tenant, experiential work. So now that we have language, we know who these parts are. um, Let's start to experience them. And this is where the guided meditations come in. This is where we start doing a little bit more reprocessing. So I have clients kind of go back with Jesus and go and kind of make contact with their child self in these kind of traumatic experiences Um, to kind of reprocess it. And then we do some kind of um, present-oriented work where how the parts are showing up presently, I have a method where I support clients to essentially support them, right? So I have kind of a, I call it the five A's. I talk about that in the book, um, a model to essentially support them in present Mm. time. So let me see if I, I got it. The, yeah, there's the, a lot the, there. Sorry. No, it's, it's, I, I think I'm with you. I just want to make sure okay. I have it um, for myself and for our listeners. So there's a psycho ed piece. And mm-hmm. what I'm really hearing you say there is that's kind of situating everybody with the internal world. And it's kind yes. of you presenting it. And then from there, you go into a relational piece where let's start relating. And then mm-hmm. from there, there's structure, structural mm-hmm. piece there. And you're creating predictability and almost like... I'm just imagining like systems work well when they're predictable and then mm-hmm. you can find problems in a like 
this thing about a family it's got to get out to school in the morning right you have to get yeah. up at a certain time breakfast needs to be done then you brush your teeth then you get your lunch bag and those kinds of things really bless parts that are uh bothered by chaos and mm -hmm. then well most of us are bothered by chaos but anyway <laughs> and then then the experiential piece which is deeper it's uh mm -hmm. it's going in and doing memory reprocessing mm -hmm. as well as uh oh wow my wounded child sure gets activated when so-and-so comes over for dinner every Thursday yes. and mm -hmm. you're like okay so how do I navigate that am I am I following exactly yes mm -hmm. very cool I Bob I'm, I'm with you I hear the that there's so many uh, so I, I just want to for our listeners sake um one of the things you'll find in psychotherapy is that people circle around similar concepts and come up with their own unique ideas and expressions. Yes. And so it can get interesting because you'll have IFS and all these IFS is kind of the grandparent of all of this. And then people tweak and whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I don't want people to be overwhelmed there. There's just a, a basic sentiment that a lot of psychotherapists have. That's to me very in keeping with the Catholic faith, which mm -hmm. is, there's internal duplicity or triplicity, or I don't know what the word after <laughs> two is, but anyway, there's internal fragmentation that occurs. Like if you just for a moment, think about what the word diabolical means, it literally mm -hmm. means to separate and pull apart. And so mm -hmm. there's a fragmentation that occurs in the, the structure of the universe that's disunifying. You can look at it in the fall. You can look at it in the fall of the angels, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're essentially doing is trying to put language to how people experience woundedness and then how you move forward with it. And to me, here's the key. Activate. This is the thing that I, I loved what you said. And the rest of it, man, it makes so much sense, Bria, because I'm with this is my first time hearing it. And I like hearing it fresh because it's authentic reaction. Mm -hmm. the, the piece that I'm always watching for and looking for in these models is the relational piece. Mm -hmm. Because if there's no relationship, people don't heal because yes. that's the image in which we're made. And so I'm hearing you go, I love that. Right after psychoed, like let's get a lay of the land. Now let's start relating. Let's be in relationship. Um because that's the image in which we're made and relationship mm -hmm. heals. Bob and I say all the time, love is actually what heals. Mm -hmm. And love can be structured. Love is experiential. Love is relational. Love is truth-based and psychoeducational. So I, I can see all of those dynamics. It's really beautiful. And I, I agree, Bob and Bria, this affirmation to you. Simplicity is a blessing to people who've been wounded. Mm -hmm. When it, things get complex, it almost increases anxiety. Like when you're at home and you're trying to go, oh my gosh, is this a firefighter? Is this firefighter number seven or four? And I don't, <laughs> and you got like 38 parts that you're trying to navigate. It can be very hard where I don't think all of that is necessarily, it's not necessary in my experience of working with people. Bria, what do you find there with, do you find people going, no, there's 17 wounded child parts <laughs> or does, do they just flow with it? They just flow with it. It's, it's remarkable. I, you know, introduced this model to so many people, I would say probably over 200. Yeah. Um, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, this makes so much sense. It's so simple. And I have had people who, um, are very well versed in IFS and who also understand what I'm saying and feel like, okay, I could just plug in what I've already developed um, into, you know, the wounded part, the protector, right? Um, and I find that it still flows, you know, for for them as well. And it's it, it brings a little bit more simplicity too for them. Yeah. Yeah. I love also, you know, there's a lot of work now in uh, trauma therapy and in IFS about somatic therapy. Yeah. I love the awareness that you have also of the body. And, you know, one of the exercises you have in the book is a body scan, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I don't know if I shared this with you or not, Bria, but when I did that exercise, it was really powerful for me, uh, just in its simplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I started up at the top of my head and I just became aware of the tension there and then down in the back of my neck and then in my shoulders and then into my heart area, and then into my stomach. Mm -hmm. I moved from the physical to the emotional to the spiritual very quickly. And, you know, for, for somebody like me who has pretty strong protectors, mm -hmm. that really helped me become aware of the protectors and the, the wounded child pieces 
mm-hmm. through the adult self, being able to do that. Do you want to share more about mm-hmm. that exercise and, and just uh, how how you work with that and and the fruit of that? Could I, Bob, could I add on? Because embodiment, yeah. I'm not sure, is something that people would be aware of. And my hunch is mm-hmm. your, your typical faithful Catholic would go, mm, something feels weird about this. So mm-hmm. can, let's just, because this is a big thing in the psychological world, I think it's very helpful. So mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm excited, Bob, you asked a question. I want to go, yes, let's go here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and let me say more about that, because I'm reading a lot about Thomas Aquinas right now mm-hmm. and about the errors of Manichaeism, mm-hmm. of body bad, spirit good, and how Aquinas really helped bring that back together mm-hmm. in a mm-hmm. way and that, you know, we're incarnational, you know, that Christianity is incarnational. Whenever that split, another split, another diabolical split, mm-hmm. whenever that split happens between soul and body, which God created as one, and even in our analysis, there's something diabolical in there. There's something Manichaean in that. And, you know, that was the other thing I loved, Priya, is, is your awareness of that need to integration out of your own work and then bringing that. Bria, teach us, tell us, what is this embodiment <laughs> stuff? How do you, what, why does it matter? What, how do you work with it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you kind of hear in my story too, where when you become dissociated and there's, you know, uh, some terms in psychology, like structural dissociation or childhood trauma splitting, where you start to lose access to the body sense or sense of body, right? Like what you were describing, Bob, is your sense of body, right? Oh, wow, tension. There's my heart starting to feel this like ache, right? Um, You know, my stomach's churning, whatever that may be, right? You're getting in touch with those bodily states or what we would say the felt sense. And why that matters is because, right, we want to understand the body as like you were kind of saying, the body is good, right? Um, Because for a lot of us who've experienced trauma, it's hard to see that and experience body as being good. And you start to also live in your head a lot more, right? Especially for those who struggle with anxiety or depression, right? Um, You're either thinking about the past and kind of stuck there or the future, right? Um, So you're not always noticing, though, what's happening on the kind of like the bodily level, right? Um, What am I actually feeling and experiencing in my body? And it tells the truth about something. So the more attuned you are to the body, you can actually hear how the Lord is actually working or inviting you into healing. So, for example, if I get in touch with this constant pain in my shoulders, right, and I start to explore that and I help clients put language to that and see how that might be actually a part of them coming up, we can start to point to that and go, oh, that's that pressure that my protector feels with feeling like they have to carry everything themselves. It's that over self-reliance and the burden that they feel of having to carry so much, right? So it tells us the truth as we listen to and explore it and put language to it and connect it with a part, we can see how they really come alive in our bodies and are telling us something almost, you know, begging for help and support, right? Mm. And then once we kind of connect that, then we can go, oh, okay, let me now listen and respond to you. And that's kind of where the 5A piece comes in, which I, we can talk about. But before I even begin my work with clients, we start with prayer and deep breaths and a body scan. So a short little body scan. So we're calling upon the Holy Spirit and just exploring what's happening right now as we even call upon the Holy Spirit, what's happening as we begin the session. And then we we start with a prayer. So I, I try to integrate it too. As we become aware of body, now let's bring and invite the Holy Spirit in, right? And then direct our, our mind also to God in this moment in body. Yeah, I, I think something that I, I think every Catholic should relearn is the impact of Manichaeism mm-hmm. and how deep that actually has gotten in us. And if there's any group of people that should be cutting edge in the front of the unity of soul and body, it should be Catholics. Yeah. And, and I'm putting that pressure on us because we, we, we laud and, and our front line expression of our faith is sacramental, which is mm-hmm. inherently bodily. Mm-hmm. You can't have sacraments without the bodily stuff, but it's, I think it's interesting how the Manichaeistic dynamic and all this, like people have this dismissal of therapy and there's a lot of therapy that's stupid and bogus and it should be thrown out, but there's a lot mm-hmm. of it that's good. 
Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, we start throwing stuff like this out when it's actually very helpful and very congruent with what it means to actually be Catholic. If you take away the physical and separate it from the spiritual, that's called death. Mm -hmm. That is literally when someone dies or the slow separation of body and soul is wounding. And that's what dissociation is. And that's what I'm hearing you say, Bria, is the work you're doing is not only healing the soul, it's healing the union between the body and the soul mm -hmm. by uh, starting with breathing and a body scan, which is normal, healthy, very appropriate, good stuff to do. Mm -hmm. So just give us an example, maybe, Bria, of let's say that somebody's you know listening to this while they're washing dishes, they're in their car, they're having their prayer time, and they go, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try this. I'll do a breathing for a second, and I'll do a body scan, and just walk us through an imaginary scene there. What, where would you take that from there if you were working with that person? Sure. Um, I'll take you through the five A's. So the yeah. first A is anchor. So that's when we explore the body. We start off with just the body scan, breathing, noticing. So let's say that client or that person who's listening and they're um, washing the dishes and they're noticing, oh my gosh, I have this pain in my chest. Hmm. Wow, there's something there. So then I would ask that person to then acknowledge that and see if they can connect it to a particular part. So let's assume that not, they have language. I know the listener probably does not yet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but we can say, okay, um, if that 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 pain in your chest could speak, what do you think it would say? Um, and maybe that person goes, oh, I think it's saying, I feel so alone. We go, oh, okay, that sounds a lot like your wounded child. Because now, too, as the therapist, I know all their parts, and so yes. I, I can sit, point them back to go, oh, yeah, that sounds like what your wounded child says. And so they, and they'll, you know, usually say, oh yeah, yeah, that is my wounded part. And they might feel something now viscerally. And I just say to follow that um, as you just continue to be bring awareness. And so now you're just acknowledging what that feels like. You're acknowledging now your wounded child and maybe the sadness that now with that, that realization that it's connected to this really child um, this wounded child part of you who's holding maybe a lot of those memories and experiences of being alone. And now you're faced in maybe a marriage or some kind of family system where you still feel alone, right? So now you're making all these connections as you acknowledge. And then I would say, invite that person to attune to that. And attunement is that is a third A that's so important. It goes back to kind of the relational piece. When we're young children, right, um, going back to kind of attachment, attunement is what helped us to develop secure bonds, mm. right? Without a parent's attunement, we couldn't form that security. So what that looks like for a person who's doing this kind of work is to imagine that child in a really bodily way, just start to see that child. Maybe she looks um, curled up in a ball, right? She's crying, what would and just imagine yourself like what would you do with that part right how would your affect change how could you match the that that feeling that that child is conveying um what kind of nurture that feeling of responsiveness to that child what comes up with you and then just do that so maybe you want to hold her maybe you want to kind of stroke her back and so i'm just inviting clients to kind of imagine that and then um, the fourth A is ask. And so this is when you, I invite the person to ask a question. So you can ask, um, why, maybe you, you're not aware why she's sad, but you know she is. So you can ask, you know, what's making you so sad? And, and just, again, I'm visually imagining that. Um, and you always get a response. You'll hear something yeah. in your spirit or, you know, I don't know where it comes from, but it comes up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you might hear her say, I'm just feeling alone. And I'm. it feels like. I'll always be alone, right? Whatever that is, you're just going to follow that. And then you're going to say, um, you're kind of, I tell my clients to probably go back to acknowledge a tune uh, before you ask another question, because so many people enter into this wanting to fix the problem. Yeah. Okay. You're sad. Like, let's figure this out, yeah. right? Let's, yeah. what do you need? And then like, let's make sure that we get that need so you can no longer be sad. But I want to, to help the listener understand that, when you're engaging relationally, right, you want to connect with that felt sense in them. 
And when we feel really heard and seen, right, and loved in that moment, it it does heal us, right? So it doesn't really matter, even if we know the solution is maybe, you know, um, she just needs more friends or we need to have this really important conversation with our spouse, right? And that would help us feel probably a lot less alone. Even though we might know all of that, we just want that part to feel really understood. So I would invite them again. Oh, yeah, that that's really hard, right? That makes sense why you feel so sad. Um, and so starting that kind of dialogue, and it sounds kind of strange, I know, because it's with yourself, but I'm uh, a lot of clients will talk about how just seeing themselves so vulnerable and as a yeah. child helps them to enter into that relationship and want, have this desire to even talk to themselves in that way. And so then um, the last question to kind of wrap it up is, then what do you need from me? So after you feel like that child is really heard and seen, then you can ask that. And then you'll always hear something. And and, and typically the responses are very simple. Um, it's always like, um, just listen to me or make more time for me. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes they want Jesus, right? Some people who have a very strong faith, they'll say, bring me to Jesus. Or, you know, these really lovely things that are, that are very, very simple. It's never like, I need you to go back and... Um, you know, have this really hard conversation with your mom and dad and and make sure that they say sorry for what they did to me. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's never that. It's so simple. And then you're the last A is act. And so you essentially just make a commitment to that part by saying, OK, um, I'm going to practice that. Um, and then you wrap up and you you'll notice, too, your body shifts. So that's another thing. That how I knew that the work was actually working is because at the end, there was no longer that pain in the chest. It was yeah. it would lift. Um and so I have them experience that in their body. It's beautiful. So it's anchor, mm-hmm. which is connected to the body, acknowledge, mm-hmm. attune, ask, mm-hmm. and affirm. Act. 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 That's right. Act. Yeah, don't the, the, the affirming is in the asking. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then the act. And mm-hmm. where, because I know as you wrote in the book, where do you invite Jesus into that process? Mm -hmm. So when we do uh, more of the processing, and you can do at any point, Jesus comes in the beginning with anchor, right? When you're, I, not only do I want people to breathe and get connected, but invite the Holy Spirit when you do this. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, the clients are usually saying, come Holy Spirit, right? Or they might say a quick prayer. Um, And I talk about in the book that our anchor is really in Christ. Um, we can experience Christ, though, when we have a regulated body. We can experience Christ when we're connected with nature or, you know, your go-to, you know, regulation strategies. Use them, but connect it with Christ in in, in that, right? And so it um, just helps a deeper layer of anchoring, grounding, right? And connecting you with the, the true person who's healing, right? The God as healer, God as father. And for many people who've experienced a lot of parental wounds, that piece is really important to see God Father kind of coming in. So that's kind of in the beginning. And then sometimes the child does not know what they want or the protector. And you, even like a really resistant protector, like, I don't know. Like, you know, you might hear that kind of response. It's a, I tell my clients, invite them to ask Jesus then. Okay, it's okay if you don't know. And then I would, that's when I would start praying, what does this part of me need, Lord? Um, and the Lord responds too. He always shows up and he'll, you'll hear something in your spirit. She just needs a patience, you know, something. Um, sometimes it's just bring her to me, right? And so you can kind of imagine surrendering that part over to Jesus. And so um, that's kind of how I do it. And then if we were reprocessing, Jesus comes in the very beginning and um, we take him to a, a traumatic memory or experience. I think I've heard um, an episode where you did kind of a manual approach. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of similar to that, um, where you're bringing him in and um, just allowing the Holy Spirit to kind of work in that moment. Um, it's very also similar to kind of EMDR kind of work, but it's very spirit led. And then I might come in and help knowing what I know about the parts, maybe try having your, your adult self come in and support this part. And so I'm kind of guiding and then letting Jesus kind of work. And also Mary is huge in this work as well. Um, there's a lot of people who don't feel safe with Jesus quite yet. And when they bring him in, their body kind of tenses up or that protector still is holding so much mistrust with Jesus or God the Father that you'll notice this resistance. But there's a lot of people who soften with Mary and and there's something about Mary who kind of can patiently kind of hold, intentionally hold that resistance where typically the protector will kind of soften a little bit in her presence. So I, when I notice that, I'll ask, can you invite Mary? And 
yeah, yeah we're just kind of letting the Holy Spirit lead from there. Yeah, when we we did the Christmas special with Jake, it was Mary that Jake was most resistant to as a baby. Um, and mm-hmm. so it was the it was the donkey first, and then it was the <laughs> Joseph, and then it was Mary. And <laughs> yeah, which if you know my story, makes a lot of sense. But, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, and, and yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So d- Bria, there's there's so many different. So let, let's just maybe I'm I'm remembering the title of the book, befriending our inner child, and it mm-hmm. comes out in April. Mm-hmm. Is that right? April where 18. where will where can people get that? Mm-hmm. So it'll be released through Ave Maria Press. So um, I think it will be made available there, Barnes and Nobles, Amazon. Um, this is my first book, so I'm just making an assumption there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Very cool. That's awesome. And tell us a little bit about your website. I know I asked and I, I said, are you taking clients? And the it seems that we're... Um, the answer to that is no, but you have resources and things mm-hmm. that people can check out on your website. So walk us through a little bit about what people can, if they want to know more about you or engage more of the book, obviously, tell us a bit more about some of your other resources. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, early on, I was just so moved by this work and um, wanted people to experience it um, themselves. And so I have a webinar that basically talks you through the five A's and um, just different anchoring strategies to to regulate um, so there's that uh, air webinar on that. And then um, there's some workbooks, too, for people to kind of um, work through on them of themselves. And then I have one for marriage. So kind of something that's really cool about this work is it can translate into kind of more marital work or any kind of relational work with people. So I have a process um, that we kind of, you know, all the things that we talked about is kind of translated for a married couple. So you can find that on my website as well. Book recommendations. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm looking at it now. So it's Bria Hannon. So B-R-Y-A-H-A-N-A-N-L-M-F-T, which is Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. So Bria yes. Hannon, L-M-F-T dot com. And mm-hmm. then you can go there, then they can see you and you've got a blog mm-hmm. there and talks about yeah. your services and then you can go to resources where it's got all kinds of various things to check out there and then products yeah. and that's mm-hmm. where i'm noticing this particular healing your inner child with god workbook mm-hmm. um the marriage heals course and um the webinar i see all of that there and mm-hmm. it seems like they can people can buy all that and catch out all, all that stuff that's um that's right there. So yeah, be- beautiful website too, by the way. That's really cool. Yeah. I like your, your yeah. and talks about, and they could maybe get on your wait list if they want to, yeah. they want to try, but uh, anyway, yes, yeah. Is, <laughs> yeah. Bri, uh-huh. Is there anything else that just on your heart to share to people out there who maybe they, they they have a very wounded child or anything else you just want to offer to our listeners? Yeah. There's so much for, I feel like I could talk <laughs> yeah. with you guys like for so long. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, something I really appreciate that I don't think I shared um, about IFS is this idea of the internal family, right? And so that's what I hope that the listener starts to see, right? That family within themselves and also how it can start to look like um, God, God who is family, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so um, my hope too is that as they listen to this, um, kind of sit with it, that they can see how every part can start to look a lot more like God, right? And kind of become more whole and um, experience the healing that comes with living kind of in unity with God, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so I think that's been another um true gift and blessing that the Holy Spirit has kind of shown me through this work of like, wow, like as I continue to support these parts. And and I also want to make mention too, it's throughout your whole life, because sometimes people are looking for something to like eradicate these things, right? Um, I no longer want to feel that wounded part of myself. How do I get rid of it? I no longer want to see this protector. How do I, you know, get rid of it? (laughs) Where I, I really tell everyone who I work with, I want you to go into this with a lifelong commitment, right? That this is something that you're going to have to be in relationship with forever. And we hope that as the parts start to feel safety and get their needs met, that they won't kind of sabotage your life or come up in ways that 
bring a lot of dysregulation or chaos, that they'll come up in a way where you can just kind of gently respond and correct and keep on going, right? That's kind of the goal. But um, I think it's really important to name because I think sometimes we kind of go into listening to, you know, these podcasts and reading all these books with the hope that I that this will go away completely, right? I'll never have to experience this again. So I want to just kind of share that. And um, yeah, and just my prayer, my hope is that they start to experience that love within that family system within themselves and then with God. And then also it it, it starts to extend to community, to the only f- the families that they're building, the families in the church, the domestic family, all of that. That's beautiful. I love what you're doing, Bria. Be uh, interesting to see how many people's lives are touched as they hear this and people who read your book and go to your website. And I know that you're already having a big impact just in our circles as people have reviewed the book. You know, we talked about Sister Marion being so touched as she Mm -hmm. read it. And uh, just, I was thinking about a podcast that's coming out before this one on divorce and and Nicole Mm -hmm. talking about working with her teenager and how much healing had happened as she worked with that angry teenager. And just there's so much application to this and and mm-hmm. it ties in with so much of the other podcasts that we've done and just brings us a little further and just beautiful. It's so good. Priya, thank you so much for being with us. And I would love to circle back with you and dive deeper into some of these nuances and, and various things. And maybe after the book comes out, we can we can highlight it again in, in a future episode. So Again, thank you so much and, and blessings on you, your family. I know the the being in the trenches of the clinical world is um it's not always easy. So just thank you for being there and loving all of us who need a lot of help. And we're grateful for that. And thank you to your husband and to your children as well. So listeners, we hope this episode blessed you. Again, you can check out the book Befriending Our Inner Child by Bria Hannon. You can go to her website, briahannonlmft.com and check out everything else. And until next time, we hope you're doing well and we look forward to chatting with you again soon.